Today the title of my lesson is Nurture versus Nature. And in regard to the, to the discipline of children, the title of this lesson expresses a fundamental difference. Fundamental difference between two widely separated schools of thought, the teaching of God's Word and progressive education. And I want to talk today about children and about raising children. And I want to put a disclaimer on this lesson right away that I do not perceive a problem in the congregation about this. Uh, what I see, and I said last Sunday, I see a lot of parents making a good effort to raise their children right, and I congratulate all of you for doing that. And, and all of us need encouragement in this affair because in our efforts to raise godly children, we are going to find opposition in the world. People in the world are going to be telling us that we're going about this wrong, that we are stifling our children, that we are distorting their, their naturalness, if you will, that, that if we do what we're doing, that we're not, not going to raise good children, healthy children, that we just need to kind of let them grow up. Well, let me just say that, that we need encouragement against that sort of thing because we see it all around us. We see it all around us. While the Word of God admonishes parents to bring up their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, or as the King James puts it, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and to train up a child in the way he should go, as we see in Proverbs 22 and verse 6, the wise of this world... The wise of this world tell parents that they need to allow their children to develop naturally with almost complete freedom in all activities. That is what the people in this world say. Let your child just grow up naturally without, uh, with, with almost complete freedom in all that they do. And, but yet God on one hand says in Proverbs 29 and 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but the child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. And the Proverbs also say, You shall strike him with the rod and rescue his soul from Sheol. Those who embrace the, the progressive education, the theories of progressive education, they, they, they decry the administration of any kind of physical punishment whatsoever. Uh, and they, they tell us that if we do discipline our children physically, that we will stifle their creativity, that we will warp their personality. Um, I don't know if we know this person or not, or know this man or not, but, but there was a fellow called John Dewey. Have we heard of John Dewey? John Dewey was actually born in Burlington, Vermont. He was born in Burlington, Vermont in the year 1859. He attended UVM and other universities, and he died at the age of 92 or 90, yeah, 92 in 1952, a year before I was born. And his writings are still revered today by progressives and are considered somewhat authoritative by them, at least in the field of education. John Dewey is called the father of progressive education. And he has had one of the most profound effects upon our educational system than any man. And that's why he's called the father of progressive education. And some of you who have heard of him will also have heard of the expression, the dumbing down of America. Have you heard that expression before? Those who read a lot will probably heard that. Well, John Dewey and those who follow his philosophy are, are really uh, uh, greatly responsible for this dumbing down of the American schools because they've implemented his progressive ideas in the, in the realm of education. In his book entitled Human Nature and Conduct on pages 97 through 99, Dewey reveals his philosophy with regard to the education of children. And this, this philosophy was revealed in other of his writings, but I'm just going to re refer to this one here. And this is the only book I'm going to refer to in this lesson, uh, re uh, at least in respect to Dewey. But he advocated that children be permitted to learn without the evil of parental discipline. Above all, do not superimpose upon the child the habits and custom of adults. In other words, just let them grow up. Don't inflict or don't uh, yeah, inflict upon them your morals. Just let them grow up. Don't give them your habits, your customs, the custom of adults. Just allow them to grow. Secondly, he advocated that children must be allowed to develop any idea uh, of, of, uh, uh, in regard to the home, to the church, and the state. Just let them think whatever they want to think without giving them direction. 
And then lastly, and again, this is lastly in this book, he denied the need for and the existence of standards of conduct. In other words, you, you have no right to inflict upon your children a moral standard. Now let me tell you, if you've, if you've ever been involved with the schools, you'll learn that this is what they pretty much teach in the schools. You know, and, and, and you, the students are the, who are sitting in classes of progressive teachers will often challenge the students, why do you believe what you believe? What right did your parents have to tell you these moral standards and, and insist that you keep these moral standards? Aren't you able to decide for yourself what is right and wrong without their aid? And you will hear these kind of things. This is what students are hearing in schools and this is because most of our teachers today, not all of them, but most of them have embraced this, this philosophy from men like Dewey. And, uh, and as a result, we've have, we're, we're in a bigger mess today than we were many, many years ago. Now in direct contradiction to Dewey's philosophy, God has something to say about the rearing of children. And, and as far as the Christian is concerned, we need to understand what God has said about this. We need to understand it first of all for our own good. We need to know what God has said because we are servants of God and we need to make sure that no matter what anybody else is doing, we are implementing what God has said regarding the rearing of children. And here's what God has said. And we're going to look at a several verses today, but I want to focus specifically on the verse in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Or the King James says, Fathers, provoke not your children children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The words nurture and admonition or discipline and instruction really do deserve some attention from us. First of all, before we give them the attention, I want to point out that these words are not easily defined in this particular context. Uh, they're not easily defined. However, discipline and nurture are from this Greek word paideia, and it is thought to refer to the whole of one's training in ed and, and education process with this resultant rewards and punishment. So this word discipline or the word, uh, as it says in the King James, the word nurture refers to the whole of one's education uh, and, and in every aspect of it. While the word instruction or admonition is from a Greek word that refers to training by word. Training by word or a word of encouragement when it, this is sufficient, but also by word of reproof when that needs to be done as well. Now, now both Greek words are used in, in the Bible uh, of discipline of children, but also of, of other things as well. Just adults, for example. Let's look at how this word is used. The word paideia, which is found in Ephesians 6.4 and translated instruction, or, or pardon me, discipline, and in the King James is translated nurture. We, we know it's used in Ephesians 6.4. But let's go on to 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. It's also used here. And look how it's used. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The word training there is the same word that's used in Ephesians 6.4 that is translated discipline. The word training there is used and it means, that's the word paideia or paideia. And here it is used in connection with, of course, verbal teaching. But what do the scriptures do? They train us. And how do they train us? Both by words. By, by words, by, it trains us. It gives us instruction regarding how we are to live our lives godly and how we are to do uh, righteousness in this life. But it's also used quite a bit in, in Hebrews. Turn if you will to Hebrews chapter 12. And here it's used three or four different times. And here, look at the connection that it's used in. In Hebrews chapter 12, beginning of verse 5, the writer says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. And then he says, look what he says. He says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by Him. The word discipline here, again, is our Greek word, the paideia. And, uh, and here it's clearly used in the sense of punishment of some sort. 
It's really used in the way we most often think of discipline. If I were to say to somebody, you need to discipline your child, we always think, well, some kind of punishment. And sadly, that's not the whole meaning of the word discipline. But we normally think of discipline as some kind of physical punishment to your child. Well, well, here the word seems to carry that idea. And the King James really makes it clear when it says the chastening. Because chastening always carries with it that idea of some kind of punishment, some kind of... Uh, Rebuke that 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 ends up you know ends up being unpleasant. Again, as we go on down in, in verses seven and eight of the same chapter, he used the word again, and it makes it clear as well. It is for discipline. There's our word. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, at which we have all become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. And what he's saying there is, is that it's our discipline that we receive from the Lord that kind of proves our sonship. Uh, a quick illustration of this. When I used to be uh, uh, in football, in Pop Warner football, my father was a coach. And, uh, and my father used to get on me more than the others. And, and, and after a while, it got to be very tedious and very harsh. And I asked my dad, why are you getting on to me more than uh, this other player? And he said, because you're my son. He said, you're my son, and, and, and I know you can do better than him. And, and so the idea was he treated me differently. He disciplined me, not the other guy, uh, because I am his son, and he expected more from me. And, and again, uh, and that's what he, God is saying here. If you're without discipline, then you're not his children. You're illegitimate. You don't belong to him. God disciplines his children. God disciplines His Son. And if we are living our life without ever receiving any discipline from the Lord, then all that means is that we're probably not His children. We're probably not His sons. And so the word discipline is used there in that regard too. And then as we go on in verse 11, he says, All discipline, or chastening as the King James says, for the moment seems not to be joyful. And ain't that the truth? Whoever enjoys to be disciplined, or whoever enjoys to be chastened, it's not pleasant. Uh, I don't like it, and, uh, and I never have liked it, and I, and I never expected my children to like it whenever they were disciplined. Uh, and so it says, all discipline, chastening for the moment, does not seem joyful, but sorrowful. Yet for those who have been trained by this discipline, by this chastening, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And so here we see this Greek word, paideia, which is used in Ephesians 6 and verse 4, which says, bring your children up in the discipline. We see it being used in a couple of ways in the New Testament. It refers in 1 Timothy 3 to more of a verbal kind of training where you are teaching, teaching, teaching people the, the rules, if you will, the right and wrong of things. And then it's also used in a sense of chastening, discipline in the sense of some kind of punishment. And in this context here, uh, of Ephesians 6 4, it would be discipline with regard to not keeping the rules. So you have not kept the rules, so, so there is some kind of a, a consequence that you receive from your parents for that. But then there's this other Greek word that's used here, which is translated uh, admonition or instruction, depending on the translation. And, and that's a Greek, that's from a Greek word. Uh, uh, pardon me, let me just look up the Greek. Uh, Nuthesia, uh, excuse me. And, uh, and this particular Greek word is, uh, refers more to verbal instruction, to verbal training, and really more to admonitions. Uh, it's used three times in the New Testament. Ephesians 6, 4, we've already read that. But look in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11. It's used there as well. And here it says, Now these things happen to them, in verse 11, these things happen to them as an example and they're written for our instruction. For our instruction. And there's that word. Our, and the King James says, admonition upon, uh, of the Lord, or pardon me, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So he's talking about the examples of Old Testament. These things are written for our instruction or for admonition. And so we're learning something. We, we see warnings given in the Scriptures in this context here about unfaithfulness. And we read about these warnings, and this is a warning to us. If we act the same way, it will happen to us like it happened to them. But it's, but it's more of an admonition, more of a, a training or teaching by word. And then we see it also in Titus 3 and verse 10, where it talks about a contentious man, a factious man. 
And here the word, is, if reject a factious man after the first and second warning. And that word warning is the word that we get from instruction in, in the New American in Ephesians 6.4 and admonition in, uh, in the King James Version of that particular passage. But here it's a warning. And you, what happens to a factious man? Well, you don't, you tell him you're, you're acting badly. You, you need to be, you need to stop doing this, you know, so you give them a warning. And so that's what this word means, and that's how it's used pretty much in the New Testament. Again, it's only used three times, and, and it's used more of a verbal warning. In each of these places, this particular Greek word uh, has to do with instruction by training by, uh, of word, or training by word. And, and in his synonyms of New Testament words, trench tells us that of these two Greek words, paideia and this other word, that this other word is a milder term. It is a milder term. He says paideia uh, without this word would be very incomplete. In other words, you discipline, that is you give them the instruction that is in, implied in this first word, paideia, and, but he said, but without this other word, this, it would be incomplete. And so the idea is this. You train, you train, you train. You tell people what, what's right. And then what do you do? You admonish, you admonish, you admonish. Once a person learns the right thing, then they, then they don't need to be retaught it. What do they need to, to get? They need to be encouraged to do it. And, and that's the idea behind these words. That, and that really is the subtle difference. One is you are trained. You, are, you learn the right way. You learn how to go. And then you are admonished to do it. To, to, to practice what you have come to know. You're not retaught it necessarily, but you're just told you need to do what you know to be right. You need to practice the things you've learned to be right. And so with these definitions before us, we can see that rearing up a child, nurturing a child to maturity, involves instructions. That is what is or what is not to be done. And we need to be teaching. Yes, we need to... Put our morality upon our children. They need to learn it from someplace. And, and, and if they don't learn it from us, they'll learn it from the television, or they'll learn it from their playmates, or they'll learn it from the teachers at school. But they're going to have to learn it from somebody. And, and it's up to the parents to teach the morality, to teach the righteous behavior to our children. So we teach them the right way to go. Then we admonish them. To, to do what they've come to know. Uh, and, and again, if, if we give clear instructions to our children, suited of course to their age, uh, and then plenty of admonitions, plenty of reminders to the child to do what they have learned from you, then the corrective part of discipline should be less and less and less. The corrective part, the punishment part, will not be as necessary. However, let me just say as, a, as a, a parent of five children that there is no way to avoid corrective discipline with children. There will always be the need on some occasion where a child, no matter how, how good they are, will not need some kind of a punishment, whether it be a, a timeout or whether it be a spanking. I mean, it really depends on the nature of the child. But, but we, we try what we will. We teach our children. We admonish our children. But there will always come a time when there will be some act of rebellion, some act of defiance where the child will draw the line in the sand and say, I've done this, now what are you going to do about it? And where, where we are forced to act. And when that happens, we should not lose heart. We should just realize that is the nature of the beast. And I'm not calling children beasts by any means. But that is the nature of the whole thing. Is that the child has its own will and the child will hear what you want and then you will uh, give your orders and, uh, and the child will hear that and make a decision. Well, will I or won't I? And you have to decide that it will. You have to decide that it will, and that's where the clash comes in, and that's where parents must gird up their loins and, and fulfill the commandment and the will of God with regard to their children. Parents should strive to make their teaching as effective as possible to avoid punishment. You know, 
let, let me just offer some suggestions here <clears throat> to help. I believe really helps with the rearing of children. And, and even when they get older, it helps, especially when they, you know, uh, and even when they get to be older than, uh, than, than the little ones. But, but when you give your child an order, or you, get, you tell your child what to do, it's always wise to have that child repeat to you what you've just said. Patty's learned that with me over the years. <laughs> and, and every husband know, every wife knows this is true with her husband. She will tell me to do something. Yes, dear. But I didn't hear anything she said. I just heard words coming out of her mouth. And so she may say to me, what, what did I say? Uh, uh, you know, and, and of course, uh, and that's the way it is. But children do that even worse than husbands do. Make your child repeat what you said, especially if it's a matter of, uh, that you want them to do this. And, and really, you shouldn't tell your children anything you don't want them to do. You, there should be no frivolous commands. If you're going to tell them to do something, make sure they do it, but make sure, first of all, they understand what you said. So ask them to repeat it. What did I say? You said this, Mommy. You said this, Daddy. Okay, now, so they've heard what you've said. They can repeat what you've said. And now you know that they understand what you said. They've understood the command. They've understood what you want them to do. And so when they disobey that command, you know that it's not because they didn't hear. It's not because they weren't paying attention. It's because they heard it and they chose to do something else. And then, then it makes discipline a lot easier for us. It makes discipline a lot more justifiable because then you can tell your child, what did I tell you? And of course, if they say, well, I forgot, they didn't forget when you told them. Forgetting sometime is rebellion. Forgetting sometime is rebellion. I forget, and it's convenient to forget. But that can be an act of rebellion in itself. And, and there should be consequences to forgetting. I forgot, Mom. I forgot, Dad. Well, you knew what I said. You should not forget anything that I said that's important. But so, when you give your child an order... Ask them, did you hear what I said? Repeat what I said. And that way there you know they've heard. And now you can go your merry way and now you can do it. Now again, if a child is little and you give them a whole list of rules, they're not going to be able to repeat anything. So be careful what you tell a little child to do. But, but, but when they're little, if you ask them something like, don't, don't do that, what, you know, and I, I want you to do this, and, and when you behave yourself in this way, make them repeat it. Give them orders that are uh, uh, suitable to their age. And uh, help them to repeat it so they'll know what you've said. And, and, and that will really help a lot in your discipline. And that will really help a lot in the communication with you and your child. And eventually your child will learn that you say what you mean. You say what you mean. That you, when you ask to do this, when you're told to do this, that that's what you expect them to do. And they will know that. So, so this is the idea of, of Ephesians 6. That we are to, to, to discipline our children. That discipline includes teaching What's right? Teaching the good things, right and wrong. And, and teaching, teaching, teaching. And then admonishments. That is reminding, reminding, reminding. <laughs> Do the things you've known. Do the things you learned. And then the other aspect of discipline is the idea of punishment. Whenever there is a disregarding of what, the, what is said, then the punishment comes in. And, and the punishment, again, needs to suit the crime and it needs to suit the age. Needs to the age. And, uh, and not all punishments are the same. And, uh, and I don't want anybody to leave here thinking, well, Kerry just believes that every sort of, dis of, of disciplinary action resolves always some kind of a, a, an affliction of, of, of the belt or the rod or, or whatever. There are many ways to discipline your child. Many ways to punish your child. And you need to decide which is the best for your child. Some children never need to be spanked. None of those kids were in my house. <laughs> you know, but I've heard of children that just they were good kids and never needed a swat, or if they maybe needed one in their life, and then they remembered, and they were very tender-hearted. Very tender-hearted. And so you treat them differently than you do the others. But sometimes you need the physical. But let's now focus, though, on the, on the, on the instructive part, the, the teaching part, the training part of the verbal instruction. Uh, you know, it's not new that God wanted us to teach our children. It's not something that, that just came along in the first century. God has always wanted parents, 
people of God, if you will, who were parents. He's always wanted them to instruct their children in the right ways of the Lord. And, and, and we learn that Patriarch uh, Abraham was a man that instructed his family well. And, and it says here in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19, turn there if you will, God is, is looking at Abraham. And this is shortly before the destruction of Sodom. Uh, Abraham is... Uh, is uh, really feeding uh, the messengers of God and, and God is about to go off to uh, destroy Sodom and God says I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. You know Abraham uh, was a man that, was, that God wanted to, him to teach righteousness and, and teach justice to his children. And, and Abraham, I believe, fulfilled that task. He was a teacher of his children. He taught his children well. He taught him about righteousness and doing righteousness and doing justice. And, uh, and that's what Abraham did. And God commended him for this and God wanted that of him. Uh, Abraham loved God and God knew that Abraham would bring his children up in the right way. But, but as we get to the law, we read again where God intended for His people to teach their children about Him. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 4 beginning in verse 9, the scripture says, Only give heed to yourselves and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and make them known to your sons and your grandsons. So grandparents have things to say about God to their children, to their grandchildren. Remember the day the Lord stood before you and your God, pardon me, remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when the Lord said to me, assemble the people that I may let them hear my words so they may learn and fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. God has always intended for His people to teach their children and, and instruct their children. And that is what God wanted. And then later on, Moses makes, uh, really gets specific about what he wanted the children to be taught. We learn some things back in Deuteronomy 4, but in Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is, our God is, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I'm commanding you today, and that's all the words, the whole thing, what I am telling you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them as signs on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Here we see instruction from God to teach your children when? In the morning when they get up. When you're in the day when you're walking with them in the, on the road and and in the evening, we're to teach our children at all times the will of God. How often do we talk to our children about God? How often do we start telling them about the Lord? At what age do you begin? Well, I know in our house, my wife began before they surely could understand anything. She would read stories to them in the Bible or Bible stories, get little books about stories that are appropriate to the little children, read to the children about God and learn about God. Now again, I don't think they understood when they were as young as they were at the time. But, but you begin early. And, and, you, and you continue on. And you teach them throughout their lives about the Lord. Talking to them about the most important thing in your life. You know, it, it's not important that they agree with us on everything and every thought that we may have about other things but let me tell you, it's so important that they come to the same understanding that we have about God. Because if they don't, they're going to be lost. And there's nothing worse for a parent than to consider that one of their children or, or two of their children or all their children are lost. Just talk to some of the parents and have them tell you how they feel. It brings tears to the eyes and agony to the heart to know that one of your children will be lost because they have not obeyed the Lord or that they are living in rebellion to the Lord. Teach your children. 
Teach your children and talk to them as often as you can about the Lord. And if we desire the Lord to bless us, if we desire the Lord to bless us and our children, then, then we need to be telling them about the Lord and, 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 and instilling in them what the Lord wants for them so they may know the Lord as we have come to know Him. To know the Lord. Solomon gave parents some good instruction in Proverbs 22 and in verse 6. Proverbs 22, 6, these are all verses we are familiar with. It says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. Now, now some people, and I, and I have heard some people say, well, this refers to, to like, if your child is meant to be a, 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 a if your child is meant to be a, a carpenter, then, then, then training up in carpentry, you know, you know, look at your child. He may not want to be a mathematician. He may want to be a dentist. He may want to be a plumber. And if he's got that inclination, then train him up. You know, there may be some truth in that. You know, some of our children weren't meant to go to college. And that's fine. I mean, I mean there, a lot of people are successful without ever going to college. Uh, and some, people, some of our children may not like the profession you're in. And that's fine. Help them to succeed in that. But let me tell you what. The, the wise man is not talking about that here. We're to train a child up in the way they are to live. The way they are to go in. There is a path of righteousness that we must point our children to. To teach them, this is what God wishes of you. This is the path that you are to travel down. Read the book of Proverbs and look how he gives life and death as the two paths. You know, life and death, there are two paths to take in life. And you teach your child, you need to go down this path. You need to go down this path. Now again, he is giving a... He is certainly giving a, a general rule of thumb. If you train your child the way he would go, even when he's old, he will not depart from it. There are exceptions to the rule. And, and sadly, sometimes I hear people say to parents, well, had you taught your children right, if you'd have done the right thing by your children, then your children would be Christian, so somehow the fault lies with you. And, uh, and, and how, how shameful for somebody to say that to a parent. It may be the case that your parent failed in their task. Some have. But it may be the parent was very conscientious about teaching their children the right way of God. Teaching him about how to go. But the child rebelled. The child rebelled. Now let me, let me ask you this. What better father has there ever been than God Himself? And did He teach His children how to live? He taught them day and night through the prophets. He admonished them. He gave them a law. But what became of most of His children? <laughs> I want to just say, we want to be careful. It may be that you as a parent have failed. You have not taught your child well. But the rule of thumb is, if you teach your child how he is to live, and you spend the time and effort in, then even when he is old, he will not forget about it. And one good thing is, when you teach your child well, even when they're not walking on the path, they'll remember what you taught them. <laughs> they'll remember what you said. And that by itself may eventually bring them back to the right way. But let's teach our children. Train them up in the way they should go. Uh, God wants us to do that. If parents want to obey God, then they must take the time to teach their children to walk in the paths of righteousness and they must train them to do so. And, and if they give them complete freedom, if we give our children complete freedom to choose their own way, could we expect anything less from them than disrespect to us and, and also delinquency? God says in the second part of Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 15, a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. A child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. We intuitively know this. Intuitively we all know this. And we have seen all too often in the homes of our friends and our neighbors and sometimes in our own homes the truth of this statement. A child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother and of course his father. Therefore we must teach our children. We must teach our children the way of the Lord. We must teach them right and wrong. And we must admonish them daily to practice what they have come to, to know from you regarding God. 
And, and by the way, in the book of Proverbs, we see wonderful instruction from God about given to children, about children honoring their father's word and honoring their mother's word and talks about it as being a necklace around your neck. We'll look at the verse later on. But I want to point out this teaching comes from both parents and the child is surely admonished to listen because it will grace them in life. It will distinguish them in life. <laughs> you know, you see somebody who's been taught right and you put them up with everybody else and it's, and it's night and day. And that's, it will, be a, it will surely be beauty for you to follow the right way. And then there's a second part of discipline. Not just the instructive part, but the corrective discipline. You know, there's one thing that, prog that progressive educators abhor more than anything else, I guess. And it's, yay, you may say it's an abomination in their sight. And that is the physical punishment. It is certainly the belief of most parents even those who don't know the Bible, that, that punishment when used wisely, wisely is a benefit to the child. But progressives seem, seem to think that we ought not to be too interested in that because that will somehow warp the child. We, we should give as little punishment as possible only on what they consider to be egregious. And I don't know what egregious would be to a progressive. Uh, what would egregious be? How, how bad would it have to be before you punish them? Maybe if you scratch their car with a key. Uh, key their car or something like that. That might be something that would affect them. Uh, but, but they don't want punishment. And they say that punishment, physical punishment, physical restraint of some sort will somehow hurt the child mentally, will somehow inhibit the child, will somehow never let that child grow up to be its full potential. Uh, but, but that's just not true. That's just not true. It's not true. There's no scientific proof for this. And, uh, and, and furthermore, it's just contrary to what God has said. Contrary to what God has said. Even some modern psychologists are advocating return to the woodshed for a dose of the, the branch or whatever from time to time. Uh, because even they realize, they begin to realize that there is, there, there is some need for physical restraint, physical punishment on occasion when the child is acting in an incorrigible in way. You just need to get control. Now the teaching of the scripture is very clear on this subject. And it really leaves, leaves no room for doubt regarding uh, the correctness of this approach of, of that we need to sometime apply some physical punishment to our children. You know, while the proverb, he that spares the child or spares the rod spoils the child, that's a proverb. It's not found in the Bible. You know, I grew up thinking that was in the Bible, but it's not there. Even though that proverb is not in the Bible, there are a lot of verses very close to what that verse or that proverb says regarding discipline. L listen to what the scriptures say in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 25. Proverbs 13 and verse 25. The wise man says about discipline. He says in verse uh, 13, 24, Proverbs 13, 24, I think I said 25. It says, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. And the King James says, I think, the times or something like that. And, uh, and so here we see a man who loves his child. You know, today, I remember, I remember when Sean was little. My Sean was little. And... Uh, and I was up there. We were in Pittsfield at the time, and and it was uh, and and Sean was not always the best boy to have in the in in the assembly. And so sometimes I would take him out, take him out. And and, and the rule of thumb in our house was that uh, that the child had to learn that it was more pleasant to be in here than it was to be out there. You know, uh, we would we would we would take him out there, and if he were uh, if he were uh, need a diaper change, we'd change it. You know, help whatever. But if it got to a point where he just wanted to go out there, that Patty made sure that he wanted to be here more than out there. There was very unpleasant to go out that door. Now, one time when he was acting up, and she had done that, one of the members of the congregation came up to Patty afterwards and said, "You know, it's been said that people who abuse their children really do love them." You know, and of course, uh, this was a, a new Christian, a new guy. And, uh, and he said words of that effect, that, that really, he's a, you're abusing your child, 
and you are uh, and you really must love him but we see you're abusing your child or he, he saw that and that, that was his view and he so he saw discipline as being a non-loving thing non-loving thing but that's just not the case I, I don't want to compare children I don't want to compare children to uh, dogs because they're not but but I want to say why do you want to have a well-behaved dog I ask, why do you want your dog to follow that rabbit trail? Because if it doesn't learn the right way of going, it's going to run off and get lost and maybe hit by a car. Why do I want my dog to walk next to me when I'm on the, on the street or somewhere? Because I don't want to run in the road and die. I discipline him to stay with me. I love my dog. And, and, and it's, it doesn't mean I hate my dog if I make it stay here and bay. Well, well the children are the same. You want your children to, to have the best things. You want them to enjoy their life. You want them to, to, to be people that people want to be around. And so sometimes you have to discipline your children because you love them. It has nothing to do with hating. In fact, the Bible teaches the, the, the contrary. The one who withholds the rod, the one who withholds the discipline is the one who hates his child. He's the one treating the child in a way that will make the child, I don't want to be around that kid. That kid's horrible. I don't, want, I don't want to be around that person, that adult, because he's horrible. You see? Because you didn't, he didn't learn lessons from his parents. That's what he's saying there. And the Hebrew word translated diligently may also mean early or betimes. And again, the authorized version says betimes. And, and some teach that this means the correction of a child's behavior must begin early in life. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us when a child should begin to receive discipline from their parents. Uh, and I'm not going to sit there and, and, and dictate on that either. Uh, I know that uh, they can probably learn a lot earlier than most of us think they can. Uh, but, that's, but you're going to have to decide that. But, but some people just say, do it early in life. Begin early in life. And that may be the meaning. Uh, if that's not the meaning here, I surely agree with it. But, but, but there's another meaning of this word betimes, and it's an archaic meaning, and it's the really that goes on with the Hebrew word. It means speedily. The betimes means speedily. Do it speedily. In other words, when you see it happen, deal with it. What is the inclination of parents? They see it happen, they see the disobedience happen, and they let it go. They see it again, they let it go. And what happens is, every time the child breaks the rule, it gets more bold and more bold. And what the wise man is saying is do it speedily, diligently. Do it right away. Don't let it pass. Again, to, to use just a, an illustration, uh, when, uh, and again I have to use my dog because uh, he uses his dog, I use my dog. Uh, but we had, a, we had an electric fence in, in, uh, in Duluth. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, Greta, she likes to lick things. You know, she likes to do things with her tongue. And, and uh, we put this electric fence up, and I don't know if she licked it or not, but she sure got bit by that fence when she got there. And you know how, how many times she did it after that? None. None. And the only time she ever hit that fence was by accident. And each time it, it nailed her and, and, and just reinforced in her mind, that is a dangerous thing. And I'm going to stay away from that. But it was the immediate discipline. It was immediate stinging. And then every time it happened, it did it again. And so now if you put up a wire, if you put up a string in our yard that looked like a wire fence, she will be hesitant to cross it because she's afraid, because she knows that she's done that before and got bit. Now, here's the illustration. If we can get into our children's mind that if you do this, I'm going to do this. If you act this way, this is the way I'm going to act regarding the, the discipline. And again, you can decide on what you want to do. It may be to send them to their room without playing with toys. It may be standing in a corner. Or it may be a swat. It, it's up to you. But if they learn from you that any time they do this, that this will be the consequence, guess what? It will begin to stick in their mind. It may take a couple of times, but it will stick in their mind eventually that if I do this, this is what my parents are going to do. And it will, it will do a lot to, to, to help them to govern their appetites. And that's what I think it may mean here. Do it speedily. 
Don't, don't let them get away with it. Discipline them speedily. Do it right away. And if you want to take it, the idea that it just means start early, that's fine too because I think both are right. But I do think that we need to nip any kind of rebellion in the bud. Any kind of in the bud before it's too late. And, and again, in keeping with this idea, the Proverbs says in Proverbs 19, in verse 18, Discipline your son while there is hope and do not desire his death. Children who are in the jails, for the most part, now there's, a, there's exceptions, but you start talking to them and you f learn from them. And people who have done these horrible crimes, these horrible things against their wives, against their uh, humanity, whatever, for the most part have, have just not had any proper training growing up or the wrong kind of training when they're growing up. Maybe they were spanked. But maybe more, it was more like a beating. You know, in other words, you know, getting a spanking and getting a beating aren't the same thing. And, and, they, and they learn wrong. And what happens is, is that they, because they've learned wrong and they really have never received the kind of discipline that God requires, that very often they become a problem in society. And like Ralph Smart used to say, if you don't take care of your children when they're young, discipline when they're young, somebody will discipline them in the future. And that's right. That's, the jails are full of such people. Full of such people. And we must not cease our punishment whenever it's appropriate simply because a child is crying. You know, everybody, nobody likes to see their children cry. I never enjoyed my children crying. Uh, and, and, of course, it, it always breaks your heart. You know, the old adage, you know, when the parents will say to themselves, it hurts me more than you. I never said to my children because when, I never believed it when I was a child. I, I heard it, and I always thought they must get some pleasure out of doing this to me. But as I got older, and I had to discipline my children, they were crying, and they were breaking their heart. It broke my heart. And it broke Patty's heart. It broke our hearts to see that. You know, and sometimes we, because we can't stand to see our children unhappy, because we can't stand to see them being punished because they did the wrong thing, we, we, we want to decrease it. We want to move away from it. But, but just because they cry, keep in mind, it's not going to kill them. They're not going to die. Uh, you know, and, and the Bible teaches that punishment will end up doing good and not evil. In Proverbs 22 and verse 15, it says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. Uh, another proverb, a chapter away, said, Do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with the rod, he will not die. He may sound like he's dying. He may act like he's dying. But if it's done in a biblical way, if it's done in a, in, a, in a way that God requires, and not the cruel, vicious way, he won't be dying. He won't die. He said, you will strike him with a rod and rescue his soul from Sheol. Again, it goes right back to the other proverb where discipline your son while there is hope and do not desire his death. We discipline our children because we want them to be what they're supposed to be. We want them to, to live their lives in a way that, that will be acceptable to God and man. And, uh, and when children don't receive that kind of discipline in, in their youth, it, it can cause all kind of problems for them in their adulthood. In their adulthood. I've heard of people sometime talking about their, their childhood. And these people are adult Christians. And they said, I don't know what it's like to be a good father because I never had one. Or I don't know what it's like to have a good mother because I never had one. I don't know what it's like. And they'll talk about the disadvantages they had because their parents weren't Christians or their parents were not godly people. And it does give our children that, 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 that disadvantage. Now they can learn by reading the scriptures. They can correct. But, but think of the advantage we would give them if we were to teach them right when they're young. And, and admonish them when they're young to do the right thing. Many a parent has saved their children from lives of immorality, from lives of crime, from, and even from hell itself by punishing their children for their waywardness, by teaching their children and, and insisting, this is what you need to do, you need to do this, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, and then when they fail, say, this is the consequence for failing and not doing what you're supposed to do. I'm talking about when they're at home, when they're little. When they get older... 
obviously, and leave the home, or when they reach a certain age, the rod doesn't work anyway, and there's no point in doing it. Now we just admonish, admonish, admonish. But we don't want to be like Eli. Remember the story of Eli, the priest? Now these men were adults. These were adult men who apparently had, uh, their sons were old enough to be married. And Eli apparently did teach his children at one stage. And, 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 and even when he, they were old uh, and they were uh, disobeying the Lord, he still verbally taught them. But, but, but in his case, he could have done more than what he did. Turn, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 2. And, and, and 1 Samuel chapter 2, we see here really the beginning of, of, of Samuel's ministry, but right now he's in the house of Eli. And we learn something about Eli. Here in, uh, in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, beginning in verse... Uh, uh, I'm in 2 Samuel. I kept thinking, why am I not seeing it? Uh, we see what was going on in, uh, in the lives of Samuel's sons. Verse 12, And now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Now let me just pause here. This does not mean Eli didn't teach them. <laughs> you know, it could mean that because he does admonish them in this verses. It, but it may be that uh, they just didn't know or didn't want to do what's right. Or maybe he failed. I don't know. But it says, And the custom of the priest with the people, uh, when any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling and the three-pronged fork in his hand. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. And thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. And before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest meat for roasting, as, it is not, uh, as he will not take it boiled, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. And if the man said to him, they must surely burn the fat first and then take as much as you desire, then he would say, no, but you shall give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. And thus the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. So here we see the situation with, with the sons. They were despising what God said regarding the sacrifices. They were in charge of the sacrifices and they were not doing what was right. Now Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy wearing the linen ephod. Verse 18. And his mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him from year to year when she would come up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children from this woman in place of the one she has dedicated to the Lord. And they went to their own home and the Lord visited uh, Hannah and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters and the boy Samuel grew before the Lord. Now Eli was very old. And he heard all the, uh, that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who served in the doorway of the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from all these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord's desire was to put them to death. Eli spoke to his son, didn't he? Can you find fault with anything that Eli says here? He tells them just like it is. It's not right for you to do this. And what are you going to do when the Lord takes judgment upon you? But later on, when we see, and we're going to come back to this, but later on in chapter 3, when we see the vision come to, uh, or, or the voice come to Samuel, we, we see this beginning in verse 11. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Now when you read this account you say, well, what, did he, what more could Eli have done? I'll tell you what he could have done. Wasn't he the high priest? What could he have done? He could have removed them. He could have rebuked them and then removed them from what they were doing to show his displeasure and to stop this. 
But all he did was say, you shouldn't do this. It's evil. God's going to judge you, but then let him on. You see? We don't want to be like that. We tell our children, You're not, you, you, you can't do this, but then just let them continue on doing it in our house. We can't do that. But I've taught them, but you didn't, you didn't impose it when you could have. Eli could have stopped these men from being priests. He was the high priest. He could have said, you're not going to do this anymore. In fact, he could have called upon the death penalty for what they did. They were, black, they were, they were mistreating the Lord's sacrifice. But he did none of those things. And the thing is, what we want to do in our rearing of children, we want to be more than Eli. We want to make sure we teach our children the truth. Remind them of the truth. And then when they don't obey the truth, in our homes, we need to make sure that they understand these are the consequences. And even when they leave the home, there are consequences to rebellion against the Lord. I may not be able to punish you anymore physically. I may not be able to send you to your room, put you in time out, take the rod to you. But there's still consequences to your evil, which you are doing, that I will not tolerate. Years ago, Dobson wrote a book entitled Parenting is Not for Cowards. How many had that book? There's about three of us here. You ought to get it. It's old, but it's really worthwhile. Parenting is not for cowards. And, 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 and I tell you, if you're a parent at all, you'll know that's true. Without even reading the book, you say, man, it's tough to be a parent. Especially in an age where you get very little encouragement to be the kind of parent you're supposed to be. You get a lot of discouragement from people, you, you know, telling you all kind of bad advice. But we need to keep going to what God says and realize that God's way works. We need to tell our children the things that we have come to know about the Lord, about right and wrong. Yes, when they get older, they'll make up their mind whether they want to do that or not. They'll make up their mind. They don't, you know, you can't decide for them when they get to be adults if they're going to keep that or not. But at least you've taught them right and wrong early in life. You've taught them the things they need to know. And you've given them that opportunity. And you're not encouraged to do that anymore. We're not encouraged to bring our children to church. A lot of churches... It's not uncommon for me to get a phone call. Do you allow children to come into your assembly? Do you, do you allow children to attend? We want our children to be here. I, I've always thought that was a funny question. Why would you, anybody disc, you know, not want children to come to the assembly? That's because children don't know how to behave anymore. <laughs> and so a lot of these places, we'll, we'll put them in the nursery. We'll put them there. No, that's not the place for children. They need to be with us and they need to watch their parents serve the Lord and sing songs and pray and do all these things. But we need to make sure that we encourage parents. And I think for the, what I've seen here, we have good parents here. People who are trying to do the right thing. And we see the products of good parenting in our homes. We have uh, the Russums are great examples of that. And the Turners here, older children. And, and there are others who have little children that are bringing them up. And uh, I could mention others, but I just don't know you well enough. But I see these every week. And, and these are good things. And, and look at these children. They're good kids. They've been raised with godliness in their homes. And that's what we all want for each other. Encouragement. And there are older people here who had faithful children in the past who, who have left home. If you need advice, talk to them. I mean, because we're talking about people who had the experience. Talk to people if you need help, if you need advice. But, but always, at the end of the day, go back to what God has said. This is our guide. And, and the older people will be able to share their experience with you and give you some advice regarding these things as well. But let's help each other. Let's, let's raise some godly children in this, in this place so we can have a second, third, and fourth generation of Christians here in this place. What a blessing that would be for the church. What a blessing indeed. Well, hopefully the lesson has been useful. And hopefully we can... Do what we can and encourage each other in the right way. I didn't mean for the lesson to go on as long as it did. I apologize for that. Uh, if you're here today and you're subject to the invitation of the gospel, the, the, it's, always, it's always time to obey the gospel. Always time to obey the gospel. And if you're here and you want to obey, then please obey. 
And if you haven't obeyed, uh, if you haven't been living the life you should be living, th then get it right with the Lord. And if you need our prayers, we'll pray with you and for you. If you're subject to the invitation, please respond as we stand to sing the last song.